Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you all for joining us from wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to our webinar. I'll start with some brief introductions. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Ben Mays. I'm a partner here at Hereford Litigation in London. Uh, in a previous life, uh, I used to be the head of Kerry Olson's BVI litigation and insolvency practice uh, out in the BVI. Uh, a very quick introduction to Hereford Litigation. We're a privately owned litigation funder. Uh, our founding partners are Ed Grundy, who formerly ran Distressed Debt and Special Situations Credit at NatWest Markets and Nomura, uh, Dakis Hagen QC at Searle Court, who will be familiar to many of you, uh, and Edward Deverux QC at uh, Harcourt Chambers. Uh, we fund the full range of litigation and arbitration cases, uh, and we have a particular interest and uh, specialism in, uh, in funding offshore disputes. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined uh, this afternoon, at least UK time, uh, by Vernon Flynn QC and Ben Woolgar of the Brick Court Chambers. Uh, Vernon will need no introduction to, to many of you, given uh, his, his offshore practice. Uh, Vernon has a, a wide-ranging practice in international and domestic commercial law. He has extensive experience of trial work and appellate advocacy, uh, and unusually extensive experience of civil tribunals, often where the substantive or procedural law is not English. Uh, Vernon is frequently instructed in very high-value multi-jurisdictional disputes across the globe. Uh, ben Woolgar specializes in heavy-duty, high-profile profile commercial litigation and arbitration. His broad commercial practice spans civil fraud, energy, banking, mining and insurance work, uh, including jurisdiction challenges and injunctions. Ben is equally at home in international arbitration as in court litigation and has conducted arbitrations under all the major institutional rules. Uh, thank you to Brick Court for arranging and hosting this webinar. Uh, as you all know, Brick Court Chambers is one of the leading sets of barristers' chambers in the EU UK. Uh, it has a very strong reputation in commercial competition, international, EU, and public law. Uh, Brick Court uh, has 100 members uh, who practice full time, including 46 QCs, uh, and the chambers has uh, links to many of the common law jurisdictions, including distinguished uh, door tenants and academics. So just to give a brief introduction to this uh, seminar and a bit of housekeeping, uh, the topic today, as you know, is an introduction to litigation funding for offshore disputes. Uh, I appreciate that those uh, joining the webinar will have a variety of different experiences of, of funding. Some will be well experienced, some will have less experience. Uh, I'm sure that most of you know more about offshore litigation than I do, and many of you will know more about funding, which uh, leaves me in rather an exposed position. This seminar is not meant to be a, a highly technical, uh, a highly technical session. Um, so if you're if you're hoping for a, a lengthy exposition of the history of barratry, champerty and maintenance, or the status of the arc in cap, I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. Uh, I appreciate that someone this uh, listening to this webinar will be very experienced uh, in in litigation funding. So I, I hope it's not too basic for you. Uh, what Vernon, Ben and I uh, hope is that this webinar will be a, a practical tour of the topic. Uh, we hope it's going to be an opportunity for you to ask questions, uh, to share some ideas uh, and hopefully prompt everyone's thinking about how litigation funding can unlock offshore cases, help you help your clients uh, and ultimately develop all of our markets uh, in the offshore jurisdictions. I'll just briefly run through uh, the proposed agenda. Um, I'm going to give a general introduction to what litigation funding is and how it can be used. I'll make some general remarks about the state of the litigation funding market, particularly uh, in the offshore markets. Uh, Vernon and Ben will then talk about some of the sorts of offshore cases in which litigation funding can be used, why it should be of interest to offshore lawyers and IPs, uh, and discuss some current trends. Uh, time allowing, I will then briefly run through what a litigation funder looks for uh, in a case uh, and an idea uh, an idea of the typical litigation funding process. We very much encourage questions. Uh, we'll deal with those at the end, uh, given the numbers uh, attending today. Please could you enter your questions, uh, type write your questions into the question dialog box, which should be uh, visible in the box on your screen. Uh, and we'll try to get through as many of those questions uh, as we can at the end. And uh, we'll aim to, to wrap up uh, uh, no later than an hour. So to set the scene, what is litigation funding and how is it used? Now, this may sound like a statement of the obvious, uh, but litigation funding or third party funding, as it's also well known, is where a funder agrees to provide funding for a legal case or cases in return for a share of the proceeds. 
the key features that differentiate litigation funding from other types of funding are principally that it's non-recourse. So if the case is lost, the claimant pays nothing back. Second, the upside to the funder on the success of the case reflects this binary risk. And that return is generally calculated as a multiple of the amount advanced by the funder or a percentage of the proceeds or sometimes a combination of the two. And typically, although not always, uh, that multiple will increase over the lifetime of the case um, to represent a discount for, for early settlement uh, or, or an early recovery. So as can readily be seen, the key attraction of funding for claimants is that when combined with after the event, after the event insurance or ATE insurance to deal with adverse costs, the entire costs of litigation for a claimant can be completely de-risked. Litigation funding is a developing market and there are many ways in which funding can be structured. It's not just a question of, of funding a, a single case. Uh, one can have portfolio funding across uh, a number of cases put together in different ways. Uh, there are funding arrangements for law firms to manage exposure to conditional or contingent fee arrangements uh, and funding for insolvent estates where there might be multiple claims. What costs can be funded by litigation funders? Well, in theory, there's no limit to the, the category of, of costs that can be funded. Uh, it'll depend on the, the appetite and practice of the funder and, of course, the economics of, of the case and what it'll bear. But typically, what you're looking at is funding lawyers' fees, counsel's fees, insolvency practitioners fees, court costs or arbitral tribunal costs, expert fees, ATE insurance premiums, uh, possibly security for costs directly in some cases, uh, and the out-of-pocket expenses that, that are associated with, with large-scale commercial litigation, which might include travel costs uh, and reasonably priced offshore hotels not located on the beach. In principle, there's no reason why litigation funding can't be used to fund non-litigation related uh, costs, for example, working capital for corporates uh, or some form of personal expenditure for high net worth claimants. Um, this is a, a less common use of litigation funding. And again, it will depend on the, on the funder. We have the flexibility to, to offer that kind of product in, in the right kind of case. Who uses litigation funding? Well, historically, litigation funding has, of course, been the preserve or seem to be the preserve of, of impecunious claimants, uh, whether, whether corporate or personal. Uh, that it has dramatically expanded in recent years and is becoming much broader. And indeed, there are now specific sub markets within litigation funding, uh, for example, and this is more, more of an onshore uh, field is, the, uh, is, is the, the, the very fast developing uh, subset of class and representative uh, actions. And you'll all be familiar with such cases as, a, as the Merricks and MasterCard case. But in, in general terms, litigation funding can be used by anybody with a litigation claim who either can't afford to pay for it or doesn't want to spend their money on it. And I'd like to spend a moment now just talking about that latter category, i.e. those who don't want to spend their money on, uh, on pursuing litigation, uh, because I think this is perhaps uh, the most significant developing opportunity in the, in the, the corporate and financial institution uh, sphere in which, in which most of us work. There's an increasing awareness uh, in the corporate and financial world that, that litigation finance is simply a finance tool like any other. I think that historically concepts of maintenance and champerty uh, ha have tended to give litigation finance something of an, an unfair taint. And I, I think perhaps there's a, you know, perhaps, perhaps particularly in England, a, a slightly English embarrassment about the uh, perceived outside uh, reward, um, which, as I said earlier, in, in reality reflects the binary risk. But I think those views are increasingly outdated, and I think they're I think they're changing. And if you're a corporate or a financial institution, financial institution, why spend your money on litigation? If you're a widget manufacturer or a bank, uh, you want to spend your working capital on expanding your widget manufacturing business or expanding your, your banking business, uh, not on litigation. The problem is that traditional lending doesn't help you with that. You still have to pay it off if you lose and you're exposed to the downside cost risk without uh, ATE insurance. The benefit of litigation funding, of course, is that it unlocks those valuable to contingent assets, assets, it frees up working capital and it helps minimize and manage risk. And I think as such, and this is 
one of the I think the, the key focuses of, of this webinar is that there are significant opportunities here for uh, lawyers and, and IPs to see how this can help your own client base, particularly institutions and corporates. How can you use litigation finance as a tool to help your clients unlock these contingent assets and ultimately help your, your GC contacts at corporates look good in front of their boards? There are all sorts of examples where uh, there may be problems waiting for solutions that litigation finance and lawyers and advisors can, can help unlock. Non-performing loans at banks and non-traditional lenders, trade finance firms with claims under bills of lading and factoring, private equity firms with portfolio companies with litigation claims, insurers with books of subrogated claims, funds clients with valuation or mis-selling disputes, trust companies with portfolios of high net worth clients with disputes. You can see that there are many potential opportunities to use the availability of litigation funding to expand our existing markets and, and provide solutions to clients who, who may not have thought of them. Before handing over to, to Vernon and Ben, I'll just make a, a few remarks about the state of the litigation funding market and uh, some trends as they affect the offshore market specifically. As you will all be aware, the major onshore jurisdictions have seen a massive expansion of the litigation finance industry over the last 10 to 15 years. There are now many significant players in the market and a lot of smaller niche firms. The big names include uh, listed companies like Litigation Capital Management and Burford, uh, and there are many well-known uh, larger private players, uh, I'm thinking of Harbour, Omni Bridgeway, Woodsford and others. And increasingly, uh, there is money from hedge funds, private equity, and even pension fund money flowing into this, uh, into this space, either directly uh, or, or through these established funders. And this is particularly so given the current state of, of, the, uh, of the financial markets generally. There's a search for yield uh, and for uncorrelated asset classes at a, at a time where money is still cheap uh, and equity and bond markets are, are high, at least uh, for the moment. Um, this is all good news for you um, because it means that the market is crowded. Uh, there's a lot of hot money uh, and it's a buyer's market. That doesn't mean that you should and your clients should just grab the first uh, available opportunity to, to take cheap money from whoever's offering it. Uh, like any sophisticated commercial relationship, uh, uh, the relationship with a funder should be, uh, should be like a good lawyer-client relationship or a, a good corporate banker relationship. You'd only get advice uh, from a lawyer who understands your case and your business. You'd only take funding from a, a bank or a financier who operated in your sector and who understood your business. Uh, and, and similarly, um, the relationship with a funder ought to be uh, a trusted partner who, who understands you uh, and your client's needs. Different funders operate in different ways. Different funders have different strengths. Uh, we're not all, all things to all people. So I would encourage you, if you're looking for funding, uh, particularly if you're not familiar with the market, to, to do your research, talk to people who've used the market, uh, see which funders fit for which types of cases, uh, and of course, where you have the personal relationships. Uh, and it is a long-term relationship. And, and of course, you're going to want a funder who supports you in the, you know, in the trenches when you're two years into a case and it's not going quite as well as you expected, uh, not just at the, the early stage when uh, everyone's, uh, everyone's optimistic about the case. You might say this all sounds very general uh, and applies as much to, to onshore litigation as it does to, to offshore litigation. Uh, is there any difference in, in funding offshore litigation to onshore? The answer to that is is yes and no. Uh, no, because many of the of the legal principles and the commercial principles involved in funding offshore litigation are the same as they are in the in the major onshore common law jurisdictions. Um, but there are significant differences, of course, uh, and I think these are are for, for at least two principal reasons. Uh, one and most obviously, uh, the law and court procedure is is different in each jurisdiction. Uh, Every offshore lawyer listening to this will have had the experience of uh, uh, an onshore counterpart who's not familiar with the offshore world, uh, not appreciating the, you know, the subtle and different nuances of, of offshore law and procedure. Uh, and and this, this tends to be particularly acute, in fact, where in cases where, where the offshore law is very close to the onshore law in question, and it's, it's easy to think it's the same. Um, that's no offence, of course, to the uh, the onshore lawyers uh, listening to this webinar who uh, who are well versed in these minefields and, uh, uh, of course, know when to speak to their offshore uh, counterparts. Uh, 
I think the second significant difference is, is of course, the, the type of litigation offshore. Um, the offshore litigation market uh, is, is very different to the totality of the onshore litigation market. Offshore litigation is, uh, is almost always cross-border. It's frequently multi-party. Uh, it's almost always complex, heavyweight litigation. There are often elements of fraud, complex and novel legal issues, conflicts of laws, and so on. The result of this is that much, uh, if not all, of the uh, the offshore litigation market is at the complex and challenging uh, end of the spectrum spectrum of, of claims that funders will regard as uh, as amenable to funding. Uh, that complexity also affects the availability and nature of ATE insurance cover, uh, which is which is of course critical and which I'll I'll come back to later time allowing. Uh, and the offshore market does remain less developed than the onshore markets. Um, it's, it's obviously most well developed in the insolvency markets, which have always been at the vanguard of, of using funding. Uh, and indeed, uh, the offshore insolvency practitioners uh, are, are probably amongst the, the most sophisticated uh, users of, of litigation funding anywhere. But why is the offshore market less less well developed than onshore? Well, it's partly the challenging nature of the cases. Uh, it's partly because the industry has been growing and, and it's been natural for the, the lower hanging fruit of uh, of the bilateral single jurisdiction onshore cases to, to be funded first. It also reflects the development of, of the law surrounding the permissibility of litigation funding in the offshore jurisdictions, which which has lagged behind the the major offshore, uh, the major onshore jurisdictions. Uh, and frankly, uh, for many years, it's it's been a case of, of reading the tea leaves in some of the jurisdictions. Um, those who are familiar with BVI will recall uh, for many years, uh, a, a huge amount of weight was put on a, a, a throwaway comment of, of, of Mr. Justice Bannister in a case called Kermas, uh, which everyone rather hopefully and optimistically took to be a, a comment that, uh, that litigation was funding in, funding was permissible in BVI. But the good news is that the, the law and, and practice relating to, to litigation funding is uh, is now becoming much more developed and, and transparent offshore. Uh, you have legislation in Cayman in the form of the Private Funding of Legal Services Act, uh, and you have positive jurisdiction uh, jurisprudence in most of the other major jurisdictions. Uh, the Accenture case in BVI, uh, the Stiftung Cell Modulable case in Bermuda, the Valletta Trust case in Jersey uh, and uh, and the Providence Investment Funds case in Guernsey. Uh, I'm sure there are others that I, that I've missed out. Um, so apologies to uh, to other jurisdictions who I haven't mentioned. Of course, uh, there remain jurisdictional variations in various respects, uh, in, including the continued applicability and effect uh, of the maintenance and champerty rules local policy issues, including around protection for defendants uh, and the ability of lawyers uh, in different jurisdictions to, to enter into conditional uh, or contingent fee arrangement. Uh, and claimants and, and onshore lawyers uh, will need to be cognizant uh, of these difficulties um, and, and, and be sure to instruct uh, your, 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 your friendly offshore counterparts. But I think what we at Hereford think is clear uh, is that the combination of increased certainty about the legitimacy and structuring of litigation funding offshore, uh, plus the flow of money and, and expertise into the sector, means that offshore is primed for a very significant uh, increase in the use of, of litigation funding. Uh, and we think that this results uh, in a huge opportunity, not just for us as funders, uh, but also for, for lawyers, uh, insolvency practitioners and other advisors who position themselves at the forefront uh, of that understanding uh, and, and start to use the tools that litigation funding can provide. Uh, and on that note, uh, and after that very long-winded introduction, uh, I will hand over to Vernon and Ben, uh, who will discuss uh, in more detail why you should be interested in litigation funding, uh, what kinds of offshore cases are amenable to, to litigation funding, and, and some trends surrounding those questions. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks, thanks for that very kind introduction. Um, I should say at the outset, if anyone has any questions, please can you just type them into the question box and I'll do my best to answer them either during the course of what I want to say or, or at the end. Um, it, it's fair to say that one of the biggest trends within dispute resolution over the course of my professional life is the permissibility and growth of funding, both in England and in the rest of the world. When I started practice in 1991, there was no funding except in very, very limited circumstances. And it was very much frowned upon 
and, and the cultural change has been very much an international movement. Uh, and there is no doubt that the direction of traffic is very much in favor of funding. And in many ways, the attitudes have moved full circle with funding seen as providing access to justice to those for whom it would otherwise be unavailable or very difficult. Now, there are still issues of principle which have to be resolved, but it's certainly a permanent part of the landscape and, and increasingly so. Um, and the growth of funding has been in tandem with the growth of many other areas of dispute resolution in litigation and arbitration. In my professional world, I have in mind the continued growth of arbitration claims, and in particular claims under bilateral investment treaties and ICSID claims. And that is a relatively newfound ability by which individuals and companies can bring claims against state entities. And that's a particular area of growth and a particular area which benefits from funding. And there are lots of other areas uh, of litigation, like group actions, which are themselves broadening, becoming more international, and again, very much benefit from a funding structure. Now, when funding was first introduced and permitted, it initially concerned the obvious cases where the claimant was impecunious, and usually impecunious as a result of the actions of the defendant or defendants. But today, things have moved on very rapidly, and funding is much more broadly based. Indeed, there are many companies and wealthy individuals who are using funding as a means to control cash flow, even though they're perfectly able to fund the litigation or arbitration themselves. And I just thought I would um, talk about a couple of cases, two cases in particular, which I think really illustrate how funding works. Um, one of the most interesting funded cases that I've done was the extraordinary case of Chevron and the Ecuadorian Indians. Uh, many of you will know about that case. It's very well known. It involved a character called Stephen Donziger. Uh, and I was actually acting for the funder itself in that case. But many of the issues in that case give rise to many of the issues which arise in funding today. Firstly, it was an extremely large claim. It involved billions of dollars. Um, now, it, this is not the only issue, obviously, in terms of whether or not you should consider funding a case. But obviously, the larger the amount at stake, the more attractive it is to fund the case. In that case, obviously, they were Ecuadorian Indians, and as a group, they were impecunious. Um, and the, the allegations concerned pollution in Ecuador. Um, but group funding is a classic case for funding um, because it, 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 no particular individual will either have the, the, the means or indeed the inclination to bring a large scale claim. Uh, and recently, you, you, you've seen the post office group litigation in England. That, that concerns some of the worst miscarriages of justice in the last century. That was a funded case. And it's a group litigation is a very large growth area, not just in England, but around the world. And it has a very neat fit with funding. Um, now, Group actions are also increasingly coordinated internationally. And one of the things I found in, my, in the course of my career is that, that funding is, is also increasingly international. One of, one of the most important aspects of any claim is the enforcement aspect, and that's where offshore jurisdictions come in. Uh, and that is obviously uh, where funders are, are very experienced. Um, now, in the in the Ecuadorian Indian case, that was a truly international case. It had uh, litigation all around the world from Gibraltar to South America. But the main center of the litigation was in the US. And as most of you will know, the recovery of attorneys fees and costs is very different in the US to the common law jurisdiction where the loser pays. And that is a very important issue of principle uh, in funding cases in, in common law jurisdiction. And it's the question of whether the loser pays the costs of funding. Now, my own view is that the loser should pay, at least in cases where the funding arrangement was necessary, uh, as opposed to a cash flow choice, and possibly also because it would apply where the defendant bears some of the fault for that necessity. And it, it's far from clear, but I suspect that in the future, at some point, <clears throat> it will be the normal position that provided the funding was necessary and partly caused by the actions of the defendant, the loser will pay for the costs of the funding. But at the moment, under English law, the position is far from clear. 
And it appears to be that funding costs can't usually be recovered in litigation, but they can be recovered in arbitration, at least, as I say, in cases where the funding was necessary and caused to some extent by the defendant. Now, that is an unsatisfactory state of affairs. The distinction between arbitration and litigation is, in my view, unprincipled, and I don't think it is a sensible one. And I think in the long term that will change, not just in England, but elsewhere. Um, the other case that I think is worth mentioning that I was involved in is the uh, well-known Akhmadova divorce. That was the largest divorce judgment in the UK at the time. I was involved in the Dubai proceedings in relation to the yacht, which was uh, alleged to be a substantial family asset and uh, to be used to satisfy the wife's judgment. It was worth a very substantial sum indeed. And the reason I mention it is because it's a case which demonstrates the direction of travel of funding. Uh, the wife in that case was famously funded in the litigation and it was very international in scope. And so you can see that high value divorces, which can give rise to substantial international enforcement actions, they're now frequently funded, certainly in high value cases. And that's just one illustration of where funding is headed. So what, what are the types of cases that are suitable for funding? And, and my own view is that the short answer is that you should consider it in almost all cases. It's not so much about the type of case, but the factors that you need to take into account to see whether it's worth doing or, or not. Many people still think that the classic case for funding is the impecunious claimant with a large claim with reasonable merits and a deep pocketed defendant. And that's obviously a case for funding, but it doesn't stop there. There are many, many types of cases where, where funding can be properly used. Uh, I've mentioned group claims that they're obvious and they're a growing area. ICSID claims against states. And the reason for that is many of those uh, claims involve expropriation by the, by the state. And therefore often the potential claimant is in financial difficulties, can't afford to fund the claim, but it may be a very substantial one, um, but there are obvious issues about enforcement. And so those are very, uh, those are uh, a growth area, um, very much suitable for funding. And as I've mentioned, the divorce claims, but those are all just illustrations of the broad nature of the claims that may be suitable for funding. Uh, in relation to offshore disputes, I think the, the obvious ones are th those with an insolvency element or a tracing or enforcement against assets. That's really where, where the offshore has a particular strength. Uh, that can include shareholder disputes, trust claims, especially family trusts. But I think my overall message is that there are many claims which uh, would be suitable for funding. And it's not necessarily the type of claim that is important. And indeed, as I mentioned, it it's even, can even be suitable uh, where, where a claimant can afford the litigation, but for whatever reasons would prefer to use their cash flow elsewhere. And they'll choose to fund rather than it being necessary. Uh, and then finally, I just want to just say a couple of words about current trends in litigation. Uh, if anyone's interested in what I think about that, my own view is that the current general growth trends are likely to continue. So you will get a growth in funding, cases, you'll get a growth in um, group actions, you'll get a growth in exit claims, that, that that will carry on. In the short term, I think there is like to be, likely to be a lot of disputes that arise out of the consequences of the reaction to COVID, particularly uh, in relation to insolvencies. And I think part of that will be the global rise in interest rates and inflation, which I think will inevitably give rise to disputes in the near term. And we've already seen some consequences of that, uh, particularly large scale insolvencies in Chinese companies. And I think there'll be a knock on effect globally uh, in relation to that. So those are, I think, the key areas, certainly in the near term of current trends. Um, with that, I will pass over to Ben Wolgar. Uh, thanks very much, Vernon. Uh, and Thankfully, ben, uh, ben and Vernon have uh, left me uh, at least a little bit of fresh ground to cover. Um, before we, uh, since after me, we'll be moving on uh, possibly to questions. Can I start by urging uh, those of you who are listening uh, to put some questions in the chat box, which I think should be on the right hand side 
uh, at the moment there are 98 of you and I think we have none so I hope in the uh, six to eight minutes I'm banging on uh, we'll be able to rectify that at least to some extent. Uh, I want to say a little bit specifically about the use of funding in fraud and asset recovery cases. Uh, obviously it's no news to any of you that fraud work is often the meat and drink of uh, offshore practice, uh, particularly, for instance, in the BVI, uh, and that many of the biggest offshore cases involve fraud or recovery work for self-explanatory reasons. I think, though, it's fair to say that until uh, fairly recently, maybe the last five years, uh, fraud and asset recovery work wasn't traditionally viewed as something that would get funding and certainly in the UK market following 2008 a huge amount of funding money was tied up in claims against banks which often were sort of species of fraud claims but not the kind of traditional uh, fraud work that we see uh, in the offshore market. Uh, and why then is fraud work so apt to receive funding? Well, I think these are reasons that uh, ben and Vernon have already covered, but it's worth just reflecting on them briefly. Uh, the first, which Ben has already mentioned, is impecuniosity, and specifically impecuni impecuniosity as a result of the very fraud in question. So often a funder is not just a desirable, but a necessary component of bringing that claim, because the claimant entity or individual simply won't have the money to pay you in a conventional way. Uh, and there's no point in asking, much as my clerks might try. Um, the second reason is duration. Uh, whilst uh, a lot of our fraud work might be for high net worth individuals uh, who, for whom, you know, even when it's in the billions of dollars, it's still, uh, in a sense, play money. Uh, there are also plenty of large corporates who are victims of fraud, especially those that operate in mining, energy, natural resources and so on in high risk markets, uh, similar to what Vernon has already touched upon about claimants in ICSID cases. Uh, and for those sort of clients, the prospect of the often very drawn out nature, both of a big fraud trial and then of the enforcement process is particularly undesirable. Uh, and so there's a lot to be said for de-risking yourself in whole or in part in those circumstances. The third is that fraud work often arises out of uh, matters which in litigation terms might be sort of ancient history. Um, some years ago, I uh, did a bribery case uh, against Bernie Eccleston and his family trust, uh, which related to bribery which had taken place in or allegedly taken place in 2005 uh, in relation to a transaction involving the sale of Formula One. Uh, the, the alleged bribery didn't come out until 2012 in the course of the trial of the alleged recipient of the bribe in Germany and at that point there were a number of rounds of English litigation about it. But by that point the claimant companies had either just moved on psychologically, the F1 deal was ancient history for them, or in lots of cases they had been wound down. Uh, and so the potential victims were shell entities that didn't have any assets of their own. And that's a very obvious example of a situation where funding can be helpful. Now, just to expand on that a bit, uh, I want to touch on uh, one case uh, that I did some years ago and um, I can see from the attendees list that at least a couple of veterans of that litigation are here uh, so they may find the war stories boring but I shall plow on nonetheless um, and that was the Candy Brothers litigation against their erstwhile friend Mark Holyoke. Uh, the litigation had arisen out of Mr Holyoke taking what he said was intended to be a short-term loan of only 12 million pounds to deal with uh, some liquidity difficulties because he wanted to purchase a building for the purpose of turning it into a hotel. Uh, in fact, Mr Holyoke was significantly less cash rich than he had represented himself to be, uh, and the money was essential to the deal, uh, the sort of thing that a 
a wise litigation funder would stay far away from uh, and was uh, had breached the repayment terms. His response to that was to claim that the defendants had engaged in a conspiracy that caused him to breach those terms and lose all of his money, not just the 12 million pounds, uh, and to claim damages of 128 million. So for the defendants, the game had already very had already very much not been worth the candle. Uh, the litigation was extremely high profile and drawn out. Uh, it lasted about three and a half years, uh, and it included a number of important decisions about freezing orders and notification injunctions, which were briefly very in vogue before the Court of Appeal in our case uh, rejected them conceptually. But from a funding perspective, uh, the important feature of the case was that Mr Holyoke had ATE insurance. We never found out whether or not he had funding. An application was made following the conclusion of the trial under Section 51 of the Senior Courts Act to identify his funders, but that application failed because the ATE insurance had ultimately paid out most of the recoverable costs. Now, the use of ATE... Uh, helped Mr Holyoke in two ways that are particularly relevant to fraud claims. The first was that because of his impecuniosity, as so often happens uh, in fraud cases, the claimant was unable to fortify the cross undertaking that he would have to give for the purpose of obtaining a freezing order. But the ATE was ultimately, after some back and forth, able to serve as fortification although it's worth know it, noting uh, that something that's a common feature of ATE policies, uh, namely an avoidance for fraud provision, was held to make the policy unacceptable as security uh, for the cross undertaking in that case. Uh, and second, it was a classic security for costs case. There was a completely impecunious company, which was the driving force of the £128 million damages claim, because that damages claim belonged to the company, uh, but ATE was able to resolve that issue in relation to security. Just a couple more points. It's worth bearing in mind, as Vernon has already touched on, that these are often insolvency situations. Uh, one advantage of funding is that sometimes it resolves or at least smooths over for liquidators difficult questions about whether or not a claim is in the best interests of the company because they're able to fund and de-risk it without having to put uh, the insolvent company's remaining assets or creditors' funds at risk. Uh, secondly, we've already touched again on asset recovery work, uh, the Akmadova case now being a particularly famous example of that. But that comes back to uh, the point I made earlier uh, about the duration of many of these cases. Uh, in some ways, asset recovery work can be particularly attractive for funding because there is less risk or at least reduced risk uh, in the sense that the claimant has already won on liability. Uh, but it can also be a long and drawn out process to find those assets. And so that can again make uh, funding a particularly uh, desirable and advantageous feature. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand back to Ben, uh, who will move us on. Thank you very much, Ben and, and Vernon. Uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes now just to go into a few sort of practicalities uh, that uh, relate to the funding process. Uh, firstly, by exploring briefly what uh, what sort of things funders look for in a case for funding, uh, and, and then briefly touch on the, the the process of obtaining funding and and and, and getting a case funded. Uh, as to what funders look for in a case, well. Each funder will have its own specific approach and its own specific criteria. Some funders look for particular types of cases uh, or, or, or have particular baskets of cases that they, they prefer. Um, speaking for Hereford, we, we have complete flexibility. We fund across the full range of, of cases. And, and simply put, we, uh, in common with other funders, are looking for cases that are a good investment um, and, and what, what a good investment uh, looks like uh, on a case-by-case case case will in inevitably vary. 
uh, and when we say a good investment, we, particularly here at Hereford, don't necessarily mean an, an easy case. Um, there aren't very many easy cases in, in complex commercial litigation. Uh, and looking at the offshore market uh, specifically, as I've said earlier, uh, the offshore market very rarely throws up straightforward cases. Um, they tend to be complex cases, uh, and we understand that, uh, and we're positively looking for those cases. Uh, and we think that we're uniquely placed to, to add value to those sorts of cases. We don't have a sort of tick the box type approach to criteria for, for any cases. Uh, we look at each case on its own merits uh, and we make our own judgment. Uh, it'll help us to see uh, advice and opinions that you've got on a case, but we're not going to fund a case simply because a QC says it's got good prospects of success. <coughs> we will reach our own uh, considered view on that uh, and if there isn't such uh, if there isn't such an opinion uh, we you know we may nevertheless fund it if, if we uh, reach our own our, our own view based on our own experience that it's fundable it is of course possible to identify as a matter of general principle uh, the sorts of positive and negative aspects of, of any given case um, that, that are likely to make it more or less fundable um, negative factors, uh, and these will all be obvious, um, include most critically poor prospects of enforcement. Uh, the case can be as solid as you like up to judgment, but if we're not going to be able to get the money at the end of it, then uh, it, it's not a fundable proposition. Uh, heavily fact-based cases tend to be more more difficult rather than easier, um, particularly if the evidence is, uh, is very witness-dependent. The, the example I always give is if your case is, uh, turns on what run, one Russian oligarch promised another Russian oligarch at the bar of the Ritz-Carlton in Paris, uh, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, to try and uh, uh, price that case uh, for, for risk. Uh, questionable damages methodologies make cases difficult. Uh, it's all very well having a multi-hundred million dollar damages case. Uh, but if that methodology is going to get picked apart or is uh, is suspect or very highly dependent on uh, conflicting expert evidence, uh, that may make it difficult. Uh, highly personalized cases can be difficult uh, because of the underlying uh, emotional factors that are involved. Um, obviously, you've heard about the Ackmanova case, and I'm certainly not saying that uh, family cases and divorce cases are, are, are not fundable. Quite, quite the reverse, they very frequently are. Um, but that's a that's a factor that needs careful consideration. Um, and and finally unpredictable jurisdictions, which is, is frankly you know, part of the reason why the offshore jurisdictions uh, have, have been slower to develop than the onshore jurisdictions, uh, say that's that's changing and I think has changed now in relation to offshore. Um, but there are, of course, plenty of jurisdictions where um, most funders would, would fear to tread. Uh, I won't be funding your, your claim in North Korea. Positive uh, case factors um, will include cases that are based on clear-cut points of law, particularly well-established uh, uh, legal areas where there's not likely to be much of a, a change in the law uh, based on the particular case. Uh, good collectability and enforcement. Obviously, if there's a clear path uh, to a pot of money uh, on enforcement, that's that's preferable. Uh, whether that's a particularly identifiable asset that's, for example, already been frozen, if one's talking about Ben's t sort of fraud and asset tra t tracing type cases, uh, or, or where you've got a deep-pocketed defendant who uh, looks like a, a reliable uh, a reliable payer. The likelihood of settlement is is always a factor that will uh, will will help uh, a case be fundable. Uh, that said, um, we and I'm sure most other funders would would never fund a case simply based on the assumption that it is likely to settle. Uh, the funding criteria are going to assess what happens all the way through to trial and enforceability if it doesn't settle. Uh, and of course, it's a bonus if it if it does. Um, but trying to persuade me that the, the other side is going to surrender as soon as they read your devastating pleading uh, is not going to work. Case economics, uh, well, uh, we, we don't have a tick the box approach to that. Uh, we don't say the case has got to be a particular size or have a particular amount of headroom. You'll frequently hear the figure of 10 times uh, the, the, the funded costs uh, in terms of recoveries being banded around. Um, that's a useful guide because that provides headroom for uh, discounts for settlement, for damages amounts to come down, and for there still to be headroom. Um, but that's not a fixed amount, and, and uh, different cases um, can bear different uh, different amounts of headroom. 
uh, I think also more generally, um, you know, we certainly want to be, uh, certainly here at Hereford, we want to ensure that any case we're funding leaves a material amount of recovery for the for the claimant, whoever they are. Obviously, if that's an insolvency practitioner, that's critical because uh, there's going to be no basis an insolvency practitioner can fund a case if the funder's going to take everything. But in any case, we think um, the right and sustainable way to approach it is that the claimant uh, is able to take a, a material a material recovery, whatever the uh, the outcome of the case, uh, if it's successful. Some some brief comments on on the process, and I'll I'll run through through these fairly fairly quickly, as this is a bit a bit drier. Um, if you have a case that you want funding and you bring it to us or another funder, what will typically happen is that we'll go through a, a short initial screening process. Uh, we'll have a look at it at a high level. We'll we'll talk to you. That will usually be under the auspices of a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, this will tend to lead to a, a, a shorter period of slightly deeper due diligence, which, uh, if the case is fundable, will result in us issuing a non-binding heads of terms. Uh, typically, those heads of terms are going to provide for a period of exclusivity, uh, during which we would ask you not to shop the case around for other funders because we're about to do a, a lot of work on it. Uh, I think one thing I'd say about that, and it's a it, it, it's it's a, a, a cautionary point for, for for people who may not be um, so familiar with the funding market, is that um, a good funder ought to use exclusivity as a period to solidify their interest in a case that they're already committed to. Uh, a less scrupulous funder might uh, tie you into an exclu exclusivity period, uh, essentially as a sort of free option to look at the case for a bit, uh, uh, whether or not they're interested in it. So, so do make sure you you look at the whites of the eyes of the funder and and, and satisfy yourself that, that at that stage, they're really committed before they tie you into to exclusivity. During that exclusivity period, um, which is likely to be a number of, of weeks, depending on the complexity of the case, uh, we will go through a much more detailed due diligence process uh, in which we dig uh, deeply into the case, uh, understand it, look at the materials. Oh, hello to Ben's dog. Um, uh, and, uh, and and ask uh, typically a, a lot of questions. Uh, we at Hereford try to do a lot of that in-house if we can, given the, the the resources we've got, particularly on the on the offshore side. Uh, we may go out for external input uh, on some points that are outside our expertise, or if it's a case of, of factual or expert witness type input, um, and uh, and the cost of those uh, and, and who bears those are, are always a point for negotiation. Uh, assuming we get through due diligence and that we're happy with the case, at that point, uh, the terms that we've agreed in the, in the heads of terms will be translated into uh, uh, the structuring of the deal. The critical document from that perspective is the litigation funding uh, agreement and everything hangs off that. Uh, typically, you will also have the ATE insurance arrangements put in place at that stage, uh, and there may be some ancillary documentation such as a, a priorities agreement, uh, depending on uh, how the, the ATE and any contingent lawyer's fees uh, waterfall need to be provided for. I said earlier that I'd come back briefly to, to ATE insurance as well, uh, and that's really just to highlight what a critical part of the piece the ATE insurance is, uh, particularly for, for complex offshore cases. Uh, it's not just an add-on that you can uh, you can rush through at the, at the last minute when you've got the deal done. You need to be thinking about that at the outset of the case. Insurers are going to want to do their own due diligence on the case. Uh, and the terms of, of ATE, particularly for, for complex offshore cases, are, are inevitably going to be bespoke uh, and heavily negotiated. Uh, the insurance premium itself on, on ATE may not uh, uh, just be a, an upfront uh, an upfront payment uh, on, a, on a complex case. An insurer may often want their premium to uh, reflect a, a success element on the return of the case as well. Uh, so that's going to have to be factored into the commercial negotiations, uh, how the headroom in the case works, uh, how the waterfall of payments works and so on. Uh, all of this can be time consuming, uh, involves a lot of work, uh, and so you do need to allow for that in your in your planning of any any funded case. What does all that mean uh, if you're looking to get a case funded? Well, to state the obvious, uh, uh, preparation uh, and the, the the importance of that preparation uh, can't be can't be overstated. Um, we, alongside any other funder, are going to want to see memos and organized materials. Um, it's not going to be any good to sort of dump a Tesco bag full of documents on my desk and ask me to uh, to work it out for myself. Uh, and to state the obvious, uh, you know, 
a difficult but fundable case that is well presented is probably going to be more fundable than a good case that is badly presented. Uh, and the other obvious point is budgets. And I can hear the lawyers groaning from here. Um, but unfortunately, we do need to know what it is you're all planning to spend uh, our money on, uh, including that suite at the Ritz-Carlton on the Seven, on Seven Mile Beach. Uh, so the on, what, what's the ongoing process like after we've funded the case? Well, the, the ideal and the idea is that it is light. Um, we do not want to be spending time looking over the shoulders of lawyers and insolvency practitioners. What we want to do is identify good cases with good teams that we know and trust, and then let you get on with your jobs. Uh, we monitor the case, we expect reporting, uh, we obviously uh, tie our ongoing payments to that reporting throughout the life of the case. We're here as a resource if uh, if we can add value to the case uh, with, with input as well, but it's your case and we want to leave you to run it. And frankly, if we're having to spend a lot of time on managing the process, managing the lawyers, looking over people's shoulders and and and, uh, and, and, and asking questions, uh, then we probably haven't done our job properly and we're and we're probably backing the wrong the wrong horse. So that's a very that's a very high level um, run through through the process. Um, needless to say, if anybody has any questions about the sort of technicalities of it, uh, how we look at cases, how how the process works, what you like to see, um, you know, do do follow up with with us. Uh, um, I see that um, despite Ben's plea, um, we've obviously covered the territory so comprehensively that uh, nobody has any questions. Um, I'd like so to offer we've, we've Vernon. We've got quite a few, Ben. Oh, do you? Well, okay, uh, good. They don't seem to be visible to me, unfortunately. Uh, ah, I see. They're in the they're in the they're in the chat box. Okay, sorry, I'm looking in the wrong in the wrong box. Um, let me then just run through. Uh, some questions. Uh, could Ben outline Hereford's criteria for funding a case and also their decision-making process and how long it typically takes, particularly for funding offshore litigation? Uh, I, I think I've probably dealt with with that. Um, I, perhaps if there's any de detail on that, um, you could follow up to, to with me. I think this is perhaps one for, for Vernon. You mentioned the post office case. The general perception is that almost all of the settlement went to the funder in that case with very limited recovery for the individual impecunious claimants. Are any of you able to comment on this perception? And if so, what went wrong with the funding model in relation to what one might have thought was a very strong claim? Yeah, I, I'm happy to, to say something about that. Um, I, I wasn't involved in that case at all. I was following it only as a matter of personal interest, actually. Um, but I think the, the first thing to, to say about that is, I don't think that without a funder, that case would ever seen the light of day. And I think it's very easy to say that there was a strong case when you've actually won. I suspect against all the odds. I mean, a, a number of things happened in that case were unusual. Before the case started, there were a lot of judgments in favor of the post office. And in fact, people had gone to prison on the strength of the evidence in relation to um, Horizon software and hardware. And so I, I would have thought that the starting point was actually, it was a very difficult case indeed. Um, and so I think that's really the fundamental issue. Um, as to the perception that very little was obtained by the, um, by, by the individuals, um, the judge said in one of the judgments that the post office um, had done everything it, it could to make the proceedings as expensive as possible. And so I think the funders were caught in a very difficult position in that case because it was for extremely, it was extremely hard for and very expensive litigation, um, which no one could really have foreseen. And so I actually personally think there wasn't any failure at all, actually. It was, it's the other way around. As obviously the market expands for funding, then there'll be more choice, more availability and so on. And maybe there'll be some other way of doing it. But I don't myself think there's any real criticism that could properly be directed to the funder in, in the post office case. I think actually it's quite the opposite. It, it was one of those cases which is not necessarily my sphere of practice, but it's an access to justice that would otherwise uh, not, not have happened at all. Um, so I, I, so I, again, I don't think that was a, a source of criticism for the funder. Thanks, I, I would just it. add on, very briefly to add on that, I mean, I've done, cases for group claimants uh, where the law firm itself is taking on the risk uh, and I think it would be wrong to assume 
that the outcome for claimants is worse under a funding system than the other route that these claims uh, often get brought, which is that simply the firm works on DBAs and takes on all of the risk itself. Uh, and that outcome is often actually considerably worse for claimants. Thanks, Ben and Vernon. Uh, the next question, we seem to be seeing in English security for costs cases that ATE cover is only treated as being worth a fraction, e.g. two thirds of its face value. This seems to be a nonsense to me in the absence of any specific reason why the policy might be avoided based on its terms. An ATE policy is surely preferable in every way in terms of recourse to having an opposing party who at the time of the security for costs happen to have that amount uh, in, in person, or I think that's got a bit cut off. I, I, I think, I, well, well, welcome Ben and, uh, and Vernon's views, but I, I, I think I think that's right in broad terms, and uh, an ATE insurance uh, ought to be in appropriate cases and, and properly structured um, a, a satisfactory response to a security for costs uh, application. Um, as I say, um, that, that hinges on it being appropriately appropriately structured, and and uh, and that's a, a large topic that's beyond the scope of the four minutes that we've uh, that we've got left. Yeah. Uh, for Ben, you mentioned the existential decision in the BVI, which found that funding agreements in insolvency cases were not contrary to BVI public policy. Is it your understanding that such agreements are still contrary to public policy in the BVI, other than the insolvency context? Um, no, I, I don't think so. Is the, is the short answer, um, Mr. Justice Jack? In that decision, was was focusing principally on insolvency. Uh, that was the the context of the application before him. Although I, I think um, I think it's it's tolerably clear from his judgment that that his 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 uh, endorsement of of, of funding uh, went beyond the insolvency context. Uh, and 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 there certainly isn't um, a contradictory jurisprudence uh, or, or law in the BBI to suggest that uh, that such agreements are are contrary to, to public policy. Uh, ben M, please can you expand on why fact-based cases can be harder to fund? Um, that's a, it's a that's an enormously general observation that I, I made, and I wouldn't want to be held too much to it. I, I think it's it's essentially down to uh, the fact that the more one gets into having to weigh competing evidence of fact, um, the harder it is to assess at the outset what what that's going to be. Of course, one is funding a case in most in most uh, in, in most cases before one has seen the other side's evidence, before one knows what the other side is going to say their factual case is, um, and the more one has to try and extrapolate that, uh, or the more that one has to try to second guess uh, how witnesses are going to do on the stand or what they're going to say, um, the, the harder it is. So I, I, I think that, that I'd, I'd put it no no higher no higher than that. Uh, to what extent does a funder place weights on the weight on the choice of legal teams, i.e., in each jurisdiction, when funding a multi-jurisdictional matter? Well, I, th I think um, from a, from a funder's perspective, that the, the team is important and is and is critical because um, a, a case is only as good as the team that presents it. So we are always very interested to see um, who it is that's working on the team. Um, obviously, we are very familiar with um, the offshore firms and and the, the the teams that we'll be dealing with in those in those jurisdictions. But yes, it's it's certainly it's certainly important. Uh, what does the panel see in terms of innovative ATE alternatives, given the tightness of the traditional insurance market? Well, perhaps I'll um, ask Ben or Vernon if they might want to have a, a stab at that one. I, I mean, it often involves the, the consequence of not being able to get ATE is often, in fact, a security for cost application against the funder itself. Uh, and often in cases where you can't get ATE, the funder will post the security in whole or in part. Uh, and then M will know more about how they then themselves fund that. I uh, assume it would vary quite a lot from funder to funder. Uh, I mean, the, the other thing I would say is obviously the traditional market is to some extent tight. There is a trend amongst some major insurers and brokers be kind of focusing on this as a new line of business and so I wouldn't assume that it will stay that tight forever and I know a few people who've recently for instance left funders to go and work at, uh, at insurance brokers for that very purpose so 
Yes, well, I, I think I just endorse and agree with what Ben says. I, I, I think I, I would fully expect that tightness to evaporate because uh, uh, the ATE insurers are very sophisticated commercial entities. They see the benefits of this market. They see the returns that funders are making. Uh, and this goes back to my earlier comment about um, ATE insurers increasingly looking to share in that return. Um, so uh, uh, there are more people uh, dedicating themselves to that space. Uh, uh, and, and I think that tightness will 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 go in the fullness of time, um, uh, particularly because uh, there's obviously a lag between the lots of the the, the the jurisprudence that covers these areas and and the market reacting. But I think the the markets you know, had had the time now to see that and absorb it, and and that will happen. In the meantime, as Ben says, um, uh, we have to manage that. Uh, we have to deal with the fact that um, where AT, you know, where ATE insurance is difficult to obtain, uh, uh, funding for security for costs is, is likely to be necessary and one has to work that into the, the case economics uh, on, on a given case which may of course m m may of course be difficult. Um, I, I think it, it highlights what I said earlier which is the importance of uh, looking at the ATE side of the piece at the absolute outset of considering the funding arrangements rather than uh, getting a long way down the track with a funder and then and then wondering whether ATE insurance will uh, will be available because it may very significantly alter the commercial dynamics of the case. Uh, we've come up to uh, we've come up to an hour, um, so um, by, by all means, everyone drop off. I'm, I'm happy to carry on for a, for a few minutes and just try and run through um, briefly some of these remaining questions. Um, for the, for those who are limited to an hour, um, thank you all very much uh, for, for joining in today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you. Um, thank you for, for 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 your support, and uh, um, hopefully catch up with you all uh, you all soon. Uh, with respect to ATE insurance, does the panel have any experience as to how BVI or other offshore courts have treated the issue of recoverability of the premiums? I, I, I think all I would say uh, to that at a, at a relatively high level is um, that, that, that we would expect the, the the main onshore the main offshore jurisdictions um, in, in in the common law offshore jurisdictions to essentially follow the the onshore jurisdictions as they as they have traditionally. Um, I, I don't think I have any sort of specific observations about 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 that. Vernon or Ben? No, I, I don't. I think the only thing I'd say is that in the arbitration area there have been arbitrators who are more inclined to grant security for costs on the basis that the claim is funded although there's been quite a backlash to that uh, so i hope that's going to come to an end but certainly there were some some early decisions that that funding was a was a was the basis for for a proper order for security for costs uh, the next question, will Hereford also fund the ATE policy? And if so, will it be added to Hereford's outlay and subject to the general uplift on success? Well, the short answer to that is yes. Um, the slightly longer answer is um, obviously the case economics, the need to uh, enable the, the headroom in the case to bear that additional cost. But uh, yes, ATE premiums are one of the costs that typically are are, are fundable by by litigation funders, um, and 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 funders will generally will generally will generally look to cover those. Uh, how long is the exclusivity period typically? Uh, it depends. Uh, it, it will often depend on the complexity of the case. Um, uh, somewhere between four, six, eight, eight weeks, um, probably four to six, more 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 typically. Uh, ben M, have you funded many trust disputes? And if so, uh, can you summarise what additional considerations do you bear in mind? Uh, I'd, I'd welcome Vernon and Ben's views on this. I, I don't think there are necessarily any specific uh, uh, considerations to be borne in, born in mind in trust disputes. Obviously, there are uh, a variety of different um, additional issues that overlay uh, a trust dispute that are not seen elsewhere or that that, that have different parallels elsewhere um, for example depending on who who is bringing the claim uh, or, or, or who one is bringing the claim against uh, that the role and responsibilities of, of the trustees and what they can and cannot do and subject to what uh, approvals that that might uh, that might bring in, in into into focus um, uh, trust disputes 
are often multi-party disputes. We've touched on the fact that those um, you know, add, a, add a layer of, of complexity, um, but that's not unique to, to trust disputes. Um, so I, 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 I think nothing, nothing particular um, springs to mind. Uh, the only thing I would add is the importance of carefully defining what a winning outcome is in a trust case in circumstances where often somebody might actually be seeking declaratory relief or something similar rather than a kind of breach of trust case. That's obviously in principle fundable, but it doesn't produce a clear monetary outcome in the same way uh, as sort of standard contract or tort litigation. Yes, exactly right. I mean, typically, what a funder is looking for in the, in the ideal case is a is a is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, i.e., a monetary award. Uh, a, a trust dispute can often be a little bit, you know, one step removed from that if one is fighting over uh, access to a fund or something like that. So, um, structuring uh, how the recoveries flow to the funder can can be more challenging in those cases. Uh, and then the, the last question I've got listed here, does participating in outcomes bring them uh, into a, a funder regulatory position? Interesting, probably one for a follow up call. Uh, yes, I think I, I think um, at six minutes past two, the, the sort of regulatory environment as it might affect funders uh, in, in in England and, and elsewhere is um, you know, potentially a, 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 a complex topic, um, and it will depend on how funders are are set up amongst amongst other things. Um, uh, and, and and I think that probably is one to, to get into on a follow up call. Uh, well, we've we've overrun uh, slightly, and, and I see that many of you have have, have hung on past the hour mark. So um, thank thank you for that. I hope uh, that uh, is an expression of, of interest in the topic. Um, uh, thank you all uh, again very much for, for joining us today. Thank you very much uh, to, to Brit Court for hosting this. Uh, thank you to Vernon and Ben uh, for, uh, for for all of their input, uh, which I hope you have, have, have found uh, interesting uh, and uh, uh, hopefully catch up with you all soon. Thank you.